back again. Glad you're along tonight. We're going to take a look at the calamity, the catastrophe, the disaster that is not going to go away. In our lifetime, our great, 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 great grandchildren's lifetimes, either, unless there's some major breakthrough. Now, perhaps off-planet intelligence will come here to help us, or our own scientists will discover how to transmutate or transform these deadly radionuclides into things that aren't quite so deadly, maybe even harmless. Who knows? The technology is all there. It's It just hasn't been discovered yet or released yet. And that's a very important way to look at it. It may be around, but they're keeping it a secret. Um, the Senate is doing all kinds of things, weird, weird things. Um, the Senate wants to make your Internet provider a spy. So in other words, anything and everything you do, they won't have to bug your computer. They'll just go through your IP. All right, that's just one little thing. But we're going to talk about Fukushima tonight. Let me read, if I may, a couple of the headline stories that we've had up and running. Now, as, as some of you know, if you're on top of the story, the first restart in Japan has occurred. I believe it's Sunday. The reactor. They've restarted. Is that right, Richard? Uh, yes. Sendai, which is misleading because that's the name of the reactor, but it's down in the south of Japan. It's not the northeast region where the tsunami oh, hit. Oh, anyway, so, yeah, okay. It is misleading, but yep, they have restarted it. All right. Welcome. Correct. Welcome back. Yeah. Hello. Now, uh, let's welcome also, and I'll read some more headlines. Uh, one of the most, I don't know what you say about this man, brave, uh, fearless, heroic. God, he's amazing. Uh, Dana Durnford, uh, who has done so much to go up along the British Columbia coast, the West Coast, if you will, to nail down the truth of the situation. It's dead, folks. All dead. Hello, Dana. Welcome back. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Hi, Richard. Hi, Dana. All right, let let me read a few headlines here, and then we'll get some uh, we'll get some comments. Uh, as we mentioned, it's the new reactor. New, it's an old reactor. The restarted reactor, the first restart, uh, happens to be located right near a very large volcano. Now, of course, the government and TEPCO said before the nuke was restarted, don't worry, there's very little chance of any kind of a major eruption. Well, that volcano right now is swelling, expanding, magma is moving all over the place, the crust is moving, that volcano looks, if a volcano ever did look like it was going to blow, that one looks like it's going to blow. How close to the uh, restarter reactor is that volcano approximately, Richard? Uh, of a, yeah, several kilometers, maybe 50 kilometers. Yeah, 50 kilometers from just restarted nuclear plant, correct? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now here's another one. Size. Yeah, it's the crow. How do you say crow in Japanese? Karasu. I knew that. All right. Ka, uh, ka. <laughs> that's right. There's, uh, those are some of the last birds left around. They seem to uh, survive the radiation, I guess. <laughs> Well, I'm, even though they're green crows now, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, animals, now listen to this. After Fukushima, after the reactors exploded, animals began to shrink in size. Okay? A Japanese scientists are admitting this now. We conclude that the smaller size was caused by environmental stress imposed by some kind of unusual event. See, even in Japan, they won't say the R word. Nor will they mention that Japanese children are smaller than they used to be. That's another one. This is all true. Giant whales, I think they found 25 or more, 26 whales along the West Coast recently. Giant whales up and down the Pacific Northwest Coast have scientists baffled over the cause. They can't imagine it being radiation. The government calls it troubling, and definitely a pulse of deaths 
has occurred. The experts are saying, alarming spike, exceptionally rare to see a dead humpback whale. Concerns about an unidentified pathogen uh, called radiation. <laughs> Dana, it gets to be nuts. These people continue to lie and concoct them more and more outlandish stories all the time about what it isn't. But they will never say what it is. I saw one story about a week ago I ran where a scientist said, we have to look at radiation. That guy's probably been excommunicated by now. Anyway, go ahead, Dana. Is Dana still there? Do we lose him? All right, we'll get him back. Now, back to this uh, volcano. What are the odds on that volcano blowing, Richard? What are the, what's the press saying over there, if anything? Or are they not allowed to talk about something like that? They just got this re, this restart. Big fanfare. Uh, volcano nearby, 50 clicks. Don't worry about a thing. Not going to blow up. And now it's showing every sign in the book that it's about to uh, erupt. Last week there was a an evacuation uh, that took place. They did. 30 they, kilometers. That's right. L- local residents were evacuated 30 kilometers, which is 20 miles. It's the radius of the uh, of the volcano. No, I'm, I got my... I got a little bit of information mixed up here. But, yeah, there was an evacuation uh, because of the volcanic threat. Apparently, recently, that's gone down. But, you know, I think these geological things, there's models, and, you know, they're always studying the probabilities, but it's very uh, general science, you know, not exact predictions are possible. So no, it's, it's, uh, it's shotgun, a high, shooting a barn with a shotgun yeah. is what they're doing. And I mean, it's just like, are you going to take the chance or not? And yeah. well, the point is, the uh, they have lied the whole time. They've kept, they've lied to the local residents about the danger and who are against uh, restarting it. Many of them, and the evacuation for people in that area of this uh, restarted uh, reactor. They're really these um, squiggly little roads that are not easy to navigate, not easy to drive on, and. Uh-huh. They go up and down in a lot of sharp turns, uh, hairpin turns. And uh, so the evacuation for people living in, you know, the rural areas or the villages around there, are uh, there is no plan, really. So, so they, it's, they, it's very they, dangerous. Where would, very they, dangerous. where would they go? Yeah, they couldn't get away fast enough. And uh, where would they go anyway? But well, we saw, I remember, far enough. <laughs> was it three months ago that volcano where it was full of tourists up there hiking around and it... Uh, yeah. It decided to go off, and it killed 60 or 80 people. I don't know how many died. Yeah, which is sad because those people were outdoors people who, you know, love to get out in nature. And But, I mean, they were there on the wrong day for sure, you know. Well, you go. And, yeah. yeah, at least they went doing something. They weren't sitting watching TV. But, I mean, yeah, that just shows you how, are you kidding me, how dangerous. Nobody predicted that would happen. Nobody and, knew. I they mean, didn't. There was no <laughs> advance warning. It just happened all of a sudden. This Boom. is not the country for nuclear reactors, you know. I mean, maybe yeah. you could make a case for nuclear power. I'm not making that, and I don't agree with it. But Japan, or the, the Ring of Fire, is not the place for it, for sure. For some, Well, it's the earthquake capital of the known universe, and certainly uh, volcanism yeah. has found a yeah. wonderful home there. Professor Richard... Yep. Wilcox, uh, university teacher, uh, is our guest. Let's see if Dana is back. Are you back there, Dana? Yes, yeah. There it's he is. Sketchy, sketchy single here. Yeah, where I'm, are I'm you? In this little community of uh, Shearwater. It's about 35 people, and the boat is like 100 feet away, but you can't get a single on it. So you got to come up into the little park area. To get uh-huh. there. It's a uh-huh. beautiful, little, beautiful little spot in the central coast of Canada. And I ran down sa- uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've been on the go for 12 days on this coastline. I went up to Alaska and worked my way back 20 uh, nautical miles. Are you alone again? I am. And, yeah, I'm pretty exhausted. I'm just <laughs> absolutely. This is the fifth expedition. I'm absolutely. This one here, for some reason, is really difficult. Everything yeah. just went wrong, but it keep, it keep keep going. And so it's good weather anyway, and so I'm able to move down the west. So I'm on totally west coast, out in yeah. the ocean the entire time. Yeah. And so that's phenomenal that um, 
made it this far. And so the verdict already, of course, we already know what the verdict's going to be, but yeah. it's shocking in summertime. Summertime, you were expecting something, you know, maybe, hoping anyway. That's what I was kind of yeah. to show up, but uh, it's less, a lot less than it was in the winter. Really? And, um, yeah, and, and an interesting, because I'll forget for sure, is spider webs are almost non existent on the shorelines. Because um, I meander into the woods a lot um, uh, with the, the dog, right? She's got to go to pee all the time, and I'm on beaches all day long. And and I and I got into a habit of uh, getting a bath in the rivers. Every river I could find, wherever I'm to each day, uh -huh. and so I go up into the river a little ways, looking for a spot, uh, and no spider webs. And not only that, no spirals and, and no little tweet tweeters in in the woods uh, when I'm sitting there in the water. No birds. And so no ins no. No birds, no insects bother me either. See, it's all food. And it's a food chain, folks. I want, this is a perfect yeah. example again. Gone. It's a chain. Gone. It's inextricably linked. These are linked loops. And when one of them is gone, the it's chain gone. falls apart. My goodness, has it ever. And it's shocking. we got really good visibility. And there's no snow in the mountains whatsoever. And that is absolutely the bizarrest thing you can imagine. Unheard of. Coastline. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be all these mountains are all, and today you can see 50 miles in each direction. Yeah. Uh, the mountains, I was way offshore coming down the west coast because I ran out of water, fuel, and food last night. And so I had to come in today anyway, find a spot and fuel off uh -huh. and get grub and that. This was the only spot. Um, but that was so bizarre. Now, um, before I forget, it, it, all the way up the coastline, it took me six days to get to the Alaska border, and I counted around 400 birds, and I seen uh, two whales. Excuse me. Now, on the way back, in one spot, in a, about a quarter mile, excuse me again, I seen 7,500 birds, and there was a, only three species, and black turs, uh, puffins, and seagulls. Uh -huh. Now, that same spot, I seen four whales and three porpoises, and they were krill feeders, and they were they were coming right out of the water, straight up, you know, just slowly straight up with their mouth wide open, all the water running out of some. Wait, 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 wait! What what kind of feeders are they? Krill, krill. Oh, really? Krill, okay, like yeah, shrimp. like a yeah. shrimp. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, the big whale. Most of the big whales are krill eaters, and so I've always postulated that the krill uh, didn't have any successful breeding periods over the last several years, uh -huh. and that because they have a lifespan of up to ten years, the adults do. And so my theory was that the whales were were surviving only on those krills. They were de that they were dependent upon. Uh, mostly, because they do eat some other stuff, but the krill is what they're mostly dependent upon, yeah. uh, was what's killing all the whales anyway. And so that little spot turns out to be true. That was the only spot so far. And I ran down the day, I didn't see any flocks of birds anywhere. Now, uh, all the way up, I mean, you know, that's not making birds around four or 500 birds. That's uh, like stretching it. But then to see 7,500 and a quarter mile was was just... What, what, uh, was, go, what was going on there, Dana, that, that made it... That, that was krill. That that was, it, was it, krill so there were krill and there. The were there. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there was krill there. And then I seen uh, uh, four killer whales two days ago in Kamano Sound. And they were spread out a lot. I thought they were... Each time I seen one, I thought he was a rogue whale because he was by himself. They normally don't hunt by themselves or travel by themselves, they're considered rogue and dangerous whales. They're very family-oriented. Uh, but there w there, the family was spread out. They did have a baby with them that was about a year old by the looks of it. And they, like I said, once again, they were spread out a long way. This is very unusual to see that happening. Huh. And uh, I've seen some salmon jumping there, but not many. Not like there was a, like a salmon constantly hitting the water everywhere. There was one deer, and five minutes later, you might see one again. And so that's what they were chasing anyway. Was um, Now, outside of that, I never see nothing else. And the shoreline is naked. The woods are silent. Uh, now, I did see a couple spider webs there were deformed. And, oh, really? Yeah. and, and We've so seen was, pictures uh, of that. Uh, spiders yeah. on LSD... Uh, spinning deformed webs, but I haven't heard of this in a long right. time. Right, and these guys, uh, these were bizarre looking webs, and that, there wasn't many of them. They weren't complete, they weren't like real webs, but they were spider material anyway. Uh -huh. uh, and that was all I'd seen. i never seen anything else. And the starfish that I did see, and I, I hunt, you know, for a couple of hours before I usually find one, which is just 
most bizarre thing imaginable, and they're really tiny. Very tiny, and they're very deformed, or they're melted, completely melted with their legs falling off. Each each morning, that's what I, I managed to I only find like a handful each day. Wow. I'm looking very hard for them. Um, and that is very, very bizarre stuff, too, because now they're, like the winter, at least there was some size to them, even though they were melting and everything else, they were still that size. Now that that size is not there anymore at all. I haven't seen that size once in the whole uh, seven um, tides that I've hit so far. It took six days to get there, around to go for 12. And so I ran in the night and stayed night, rather, because I wanted to get the conversation in with you guys and just try to get people to really appreciate that this is not a game anymore. This is not a joke anymore. It's not a, it's not a maybe. It's not an if. It's not, you know, what if. It's really, truly done. It's a done deal. And obviously, this extinction happened immediately. Um, I did find a one single beach up in Poachers Island full of cockles. And they're, they're um, shellfish. They're like a clam. Uh, and that was... You know, there was, uh, there was nothing else there with them. Now, there was no mussels with them, no little necks or manila hmm. clams, no razorback clams with them, no oysters or no gooey duck shells there. There was none of, no other shells there, just the cockle shells itself. And uh, outside of that, uh, that was the only experience I had out of the whole coastline since last year, really, of, of life on the coastline, right? And so the snow is gone, the life is gone, the, the insects are gone, the birds are gone. The, the big feeder fish are that's all that's left, and they're they're feeding on each other now. They're cannibalizing each other. Are they? And oh. that's what's literally going on now. Everything is everything out there. The only thing that can survive out there is cannibalizing each other. I had um, uh, I know Richard uh, Professor I should call him wants to have yeah. uh, part of this too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but I was talking, just before I forget, I was talking, and the last part of it was that I was talking to a, a guide up in Prince Rupert, and he spotted me, and he came up and he talked to me. He had a fleet of boats, uh -huh. and he's following Fukushima, and he, and he asked me some really pertinent questions about it, and you can see him, right? He he, he understood, but he, he didn't understand, and so his questions were really straightforward, like, is it still ongoing? Because he still couldn't. He didn't him know, him and he's a commercial fisherman. Wow. He couldn't figure out whether the reactors were still hemorrhaging into the ocean because right. he couldn't find a reliable source that would tell him that. No. That's the he'd problem. Have to know right? the the website. He'd have to go to rents.com or something. <laughs> right. Because yeah, the mainstream yeah, media exactly. is, is hiding it all. Right. I did suggest that, by the way. And yeah, <laughs> no, no. Uh, the fact is that. That's that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because I hear that a lot where people yeah. don't understand it. Right. I know I know where you're too, Richard, yeah. that you know you know, when people compare radiation to bananas, potato chips and walking in sunshine yeah. and getting on an airplane, right? And then they say, Okay, well we're allowed to get four hundred millisieverts a year, blah blah blah, uh, natural radiation, but then so you're getting the atomosity equivalent doses in such a short time. Well that's not actually true because they're two different radiations, right? And yeah. you know, what, yeah. if you ingest a radioactive atom, you stand a good chance of getting right. some kind of autoimmune deficiency, right? And so like you, you and and also, uh, man-made uh, radionuclides are different. They have a different um, aspect to them. They can, uh, they're larger, or they can be stuck in your in your body. And uh, they they really, uh, you're normally uh, through evolution, you expel the natural forms of radiation, like from a banana. But our artificial ones, it's yeah. not clear that they go through you so easily. Uh, that's from uh, Paul Zimmerman's work that I yeah am Paul's, citing, but, Paul's yeah. very very smart. The, yeah. What what is what is going on? And yeah, you live in Tokyo, all right. Yeah. What is going on there in terms of food, supermarkets, people being educated? Yeah. There was a time yeah. when the markets yeah. were talking about it. There was right. a time when people were seeing with Geiger counters. Yeah. Are those days yeah. over? 
Yeah, and, you know, that's right, Jeff. Uh, we covered that on your show, that, that time, that, and this is a couple of years ago, that the big supermarket chain, I think it was called Aeon, A-E-O, A-E-O-N perhaps, uh, they were going to have 0% radiation in their food as their standard, and the uh-huh. government uh, forbid that. Remember that? And they forbid that, that so no free market, uh, because people wanted that, but that would discriminate discriminate against, you know, uh, uh, sellers that would have a little bit of radiation in their food. So right. that after that decision, and then you had a flood of uh, uh, bad rumors, uh, you know, stamping out bad rumors about radiation, you know, it's just a rumor. And so anything with uh, under 100 millisieverts, 100 microsieverts, uh, or 100 becquerel, sorry, per kilogram, would be legal. Um and you can, but even so, you can't say anything bad about it because it's under the limit. So, well, um, and they've raised the limit though. They keep yeah. raising the limit. They just raised them again, didn't they? Not too long ago. Well, yeah. well, not in Japan that I know of. They, uh, perhaps not that I've heard. But I've, in the U.S., I mean, there's sort of like no limit, right? It's fifteen hundred becquerels per kilogram. But but the thing is, if you're getting it every day, even if it's minute amounts, and I did check the water because last time you and I talked, Jeff, uh, I went to the national. Uh, nuclear regulatory uh, website, which has taken over things in Japan, and they have all sorts of data, but it's all really low level, but they hmm. did have, so I mean, it, whether we can trust it or not, and I, I wrote a little commentary on that, because um, I have witnessed firsthand that the fraudulent data being taken in a, in a certain location, so I documented that, but I can't say for everything that they publish. Hmm. Um, but uh, anyway, the point is, in Tokyo, it's kind of interesting, even this, you know, very conservative, uh, and they don't tell their methodology, so I'm interested in Dana's opinion about this, but uh, they don't say what kind of Geiger counters they use or how they measure it very specifically at all. But uh, Tokyo Water Supply does have cesium-137 at kind of a high, relatively high level. It, you know, in all the other prefectures, it says ND, no, non-detectable, you know, but so... That's a that's, lie. That's just, yeah, right. Even non-detectable is, um, even according to their own charts, there is radiation, but they say, well, it's so low that we just call it NG. That's right. It's but all. They, it's a lie. Yeah. yeah. It's there. Yeah. Sure. sure. And it's all bioaccumulatable. Yeah, remember that. Very skeptical about that's, everything that that well, comes. that's that's what's happened that Dana has seen. Keep keep in mind the bioaccumulation over the years in the links in the food chain have killed it, broken it up. It's uh, it's a tragedy beyond yeah. comprehension, and no one in the mainstream media will talk about it. Yeah, right. unbelievable. All right, Dana, go ahead. Um, you know. When you they say 100 becquels per kilogram, or even yeah. in America, 1,500 becquels a kilogram, uh, becquel is, 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 to me, the way I look at it, is a death sentence. Because when you got one of these becquels in you, they're identifying, say, cesium, but there's 100 times more strontium-90 that came with that. And if it was an iodine, then it was 10 times more iodine-131, 30 times more iodine-132, 20. 31 times more right time 129. And so, and who, you know, there's, you need 2,000 Geiger counters to calibrate 2,000 isotopes in order to, and 2,000 people that are trained to use each of those Geiger counters mm-hmm. to figure out what came true and you need to have it done when it happened. Huh. And you still need to do it, right? How uh-huh. could you, you know, organize and pay for all that and a lot of these Geiger so-called, I'm just using the word broadly as a Geiger counter, it could be a, t- a million dollars a pop for some of these, uh, you know, Obscure nuclei. Right, and yeah. and Yoshi Sumatra was saying that the tritium from the reactors that because they can't filter it mm. out. Uh, that's why there's no snow in the mountains, right. and I agree with him wholeheartedly because the snow couldn't crystallize. And I think that was a brilliant observation on his part. Um, you know, and and then when you think about how many actual isotopes that are out there man-made, there's tens of thousands that we don't know about because they're hid away and classified and under security blankets, mm-hmm. and so we don't even know what, but we know they exist, they admit right. to, you know, over 10,000 of them, but we only hear about uh, cesium-137, iodine-131. Uh, 
And so it's a, once you know, once you, they're emblematic of all the other isotopes. If you heard of one of them and showed up, then you assume that everything else had to show up. And so when they say 100 Beckles, that they're checking for cesium, there's 30,000 Beckles extra there probably. Really? See, now, how, how is it, that, how do you do them, how do you do the multiplier again for that? Well, when it's iodine-131, which is what they look for and what they can find, yeah. then you, you know everything But that's got a very short half-life. Why would they look for something right. with a short half-life? Why wouldn't they look for something with a longer half-life? Well, because it sounds good with an eight-day half-life. And it's easy. They can find that, apparently. They're able to, because it is a fissionable product. Uh, but there's uh, but we know there's 10 times more produced in uh, uh -huh. 132. And for uh -huh. every single iodine, 131. And that there was uh, 30 times more 132 for uh, every single iodine. So if you ingested a single one of them, odds were you ingested 30 of these and 30 of Great. those. And 29 of them and 50 of these and 100 uh, strontium. Yeah, I got, got it. Got it. Got it. It's brutal. Right. How how has uh, plutonium? Yeah, how has the plutonium? plutonium and plutonium is in the water. Up to two hundred thousand times hotter. It burns it up to two hundred thousand right. times hotter. That's why that, the that's why the mox that's fuel. Right, and uh, that's why it was consumed so fast and atomized aerosol. That's at such uh, and then of course that atomized aerosol and ionizing radiated wow. the steel and the, and cement and. And the structure of the building and the rocks and everything else, because it's once you know rocks will melt and atomize it. And so these things were popping off, especially that one was hitting nine thousand degree Fahrenheit temperatures. And so this was eating and consuming and ionizing, radiating everything, and that a pound of it can kill everything on the planet in increments. Yeah, over a period Richard, of time. be careful! Don't breathe into the phone. It's really picking it up for some reason when you exhale. Oh, sorry. That's okay. It's the fan. It's hot here. <laughs> oh, is it? That's oh, the it's sand? A hot summer. Maybe. Uh, it sounds like you're just that. gently exhaling. Uh, okay. Yeah, now, okay. the Canadian government, have they raised the safe limits of exposure like the U.S. government has? The same kind of thing? Seven million beckles of tritium per cubic meter of water. Come and on. They, they, yeah, and they put in cesium and strontium uh, as a normal natural radioactive element now. Even though they call it artificial radionuclides, the artificial radionuclides in our drinking water are 0 0.05 and 0 0.5 beckles uh -huh, uh -huh. of uranium and potassium, stuff like this, which is, I don't know why they included that because it's irrelevant. Like you say, it's homeostasis, the potassium and that kind of uranium is homeostasis, your body regulates it. Right. But, but the man-made stuff is sequestered into your organs and into your muscles and into Good your Good luck. Bones. You watch five to ten years from now how many cancers are going to be all over the place. Children, adults, Dr. Or Greenman, Dr. Raymond Gilmetti, didn't mean to cut you off, Chuck. Dr. That's Raymond great. Gilmetti from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, mm -hmm. he spent 35 years uh, taking beagle dogs and beagle puppies, I kid you not, and getting them to inhale plutonium and americium. And what his studies showed, and I got uh, 84 of his studies, hmm. and I've done videos about that with those studies, is that even the smallest particle would kill 70% of the animals within about four years. Wow. And so when you multiply that in the human years, and then, but when you look at the toxicity of the elements that were coming out of Fukushima, much different than Chernobyl. Chernobyl was only a 30% meltdown. Chernobyl was one-third the size of any of the reactors. In Japan, Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. Chernobyl, a million qualified, you know, it was conscripted, but still they had all the equipment and they had the, the guts to go do the job. And, and yeah. they weren't drunk and they weren't... They were able to read and write. They weren't like the homeless and the destitute and, and the victims in Fukushima. And Chernobyl stopped was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. Fukushima, like I say, folks, Fukushima didn't stop. So that's the significance of it. it Fukushima has not stopped stopped. consuming everything. It's not going you know, to stop. They lost all of its inventories. They, they all, you know, if I put a pot on the stove at, and boil the water at 120 degrees or 150 degrees, what happens if I put uh, that same pot on the stove at 9,000 degrees? Well, the water doesn't matter because the pot ain't there anymore. It, it atomized the aerosols, right? And so that was the, that was the event that took out the whole coastline and took out the animal species, the marine species, the bird species. Oh, the sad. The whole coast of Pacific Rim nations was that initial event, and then the ongoing doesn't give it a chance to even try to recover. Like the studies showed after testing, the bomb testing back in the 60s, mm -hmm. um, you know, the production of the marine life in those areas went down 50% and stayed permanently because they never stopped 
releasing your nucleoids into the ocean and dumping it into the ocean and everything else. Can I ask Dana a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Dana, would you say that uh, Fukushima is part two of the above ground nuclear test uh, in that sense? You said that it's, it's, it's a nuclear you know, damage the ecosystem. It's, a it's, a, it's actually hour. worse, uh, I yeah. think. Yeah. It's non well, compared to nuclear testing, it's like, uh, when you compare it to nuclear testing, my, my take on it is it's equal to about a thousand nuclear bombs a day, the animosity equivalent going into the environment in the ocean every day, because it, like when you put it up against a Chernobyl model of 10 days and it was 400 Hiroshima right. bombs worth of the animosity equivalent of it. And so when you use that, just that model, it's not counting the fuel pools, that's just counting the reactors. So we're not we're not counting the spent what they call the spent fuel pool, which is where they put all the reactors. Of course, you know all of that. But actually, right. all reactors are, are you take it, you know take one of those rods ten years after they're used, folks, and then put it in a uh, one pound of that rod and put it in a theater, and you'll kill everybody there. And you can in twenty minutes, half an hour, you can drag all the bodies out and do that every twenty minutes or half an hour with a couple hundred people with that same one pound. But they call it spent fuel. But how is that spent when they can do something like that, and we don't have anywhere to put it? In fact. Well, is it, to take it, the waste. is it not, Dana, is it not, and Richard, is it not more dangerous after it has been so-called yes, spent? That's correct. Right. Yeah. I, I knew that. I just 100%. wanted to make, you, well, I just wanted I, to ask I mean, that, that was as a the question. the big worry of the Unit 4 uh, pool that they supposedly have, you know, downloaded, but that was what everybody was worried about because it could collapse, but it, apparently that's passed, but they still have, I guess it's in dry storage next to the next to the reactor there, but it's still on that dangerous site just sitting there, so. Well, the building has subsided 32 inches on the north side. Yeah. The buildings are kind of collapsing. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Dana, you mean the, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, like, go ahead, Richard. Okay. Um, Dana, so, I mean, there's a certain amount of uh, radiation going through the uh, groundwater into the ocean every day, plus there's radiation uh, uh, airborne that's just go up, up drafting off the plant. And so you're saying that every day that radiation is equivalent to, uh, I don't know what you said, a, a thousand nuclear bombs thousand. or something, but, but yeah. it's uh, the, the number See, of backgrounds that's bomb? leaking total, yeah. Yeah, they, they tell you about strontium, or they'll tell you about cesium leaking into the ocean. Right. They'll tell you about one of these isotopes, but they don't tell you about the other thousand right. you know, long-lived isotopes. And so once they admit to one, not that we need them to admit to anything, because we watch the detonations. We, we know rough volumes of what they had there. We know how often they were changing the fuels out in the cycle since they started those places. And we know that the toxicity of the material that they were using was extraordinary. And once again, you know, there was 12,000 kilograms plutonium in reactor three, but there was also, uh, and I got a number of reports on it originally, of, of up to 1,000 kilograms in each one of the other reactors. Once again, wow. what they tell us, once you tell us right. you have to multiply it thousands of times, once again, whatever they, they allude to, you right. have to deduct from it. It's just that's all you're really ever going to do with these people. They're not going to tell you the truth. So when you look at Chernobyl and understand really truly what happened there, or you look at the animosity equivalent of the of the depleted uranium itself, uh -huh. because like the chain reaction, right? The chain reaction. It's not running. I'm not talking about so much about the stuff that's running over the fuel rods that it detonated and sunk down into the topsoil that they had there, or that went into the ocean. Even though that's huge, don't get me wrong. It's those chain reactions. They're consuming everything and they're releasing. That's that's what's doing the numbers. That's what creates all these numbers. That's what happened at Chernobyl. That's why the, you still can't eat the meat in the UK and Ireland and Scotland, certain parts of it, or drink the milk because of that 10 day releases. This thing hasn't stopped, see? Yep. That's that, why. Yep. Yeah. It's a chain reaction. It's not so much what's running over to spend fuels and everything, or it is. Don't get me wrong. That certainly adds up to it. That could be. There's so many know. factors. Hold on. We have to take a break. We'll come right back. Uh, Richard Wilcox is in Tokyo, and we'll find out more about life in Tokyo now, a city that by all rights should have been and still should be, according to many, evacuated. A city of 30 million people. Be right back in just a couple. Okay, 
Okay, back with Dana and Richard. Richard's in Tokyo. Richard, with the Abe regime over there, uh, very bellicose, uh, would love to win World War II, uh, even though it's over. Uh, what do we got going over there in terms of a government? I mean, is it this a government that the people really care about? Are they interested in it? Or are they just, don't bother me, I'm busy? Yes, to all of the above. Uh, It's really disturbing. I heard that uh, 44% of the respondents to a survey uh, agreed with Abe's phony uh, (laughs) war apology, you know, this mishmash that he comes up with. The thing is, there's a lot of people in the countryside, they have stronger voting because of the districting. Uh, I think, not to sound chauvinistic, but I think they're less sophisticated, less educated, and they they don't have analytical minds. I mean, they voted for, in Fukushima, they voted for Abe, uh, they voted, sorry, for the LDP, which is his party, the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, after Fukushima, and they still voted the LDP back in, just because that's what they're used to, you know, uh, they're older folks, a lot of the people in the countryside who have this voting power. Um, so, sure, there are more sophisticated people that don't agree with Abe. They don't agree with the dismantling of the Constitution. They don't want to go to war again. Uh, there are older soldiers, too, who have recounted the horrors of the war. And even on television, they've been, uh, there was a guy 100 years old on TV the other day recounting it. But, you wow. know, they, they wait until he's 100 years old to let him tell his story. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. But, yeah, so Abe claimed uh, we didn't, we never surrendered, or I've never read the Potsdam Declaration, and it doesn't matter to me, or something like that. It's totally absurd. Um, and, and it's just part of this uh, bellicose, as you say, uh, agenda to remilitarize Japan. And, of course, nuclear technology is a part of that. And uh, I'm not... I, I think very, it's a big part of it from what I can see over yeah. here. Uh, right. Not only do they already have nuclear weapons, but they want to be public about it. Well, right. Uh, I'm very um, cautious about, I'm, you know, I just uh, let the people who are more uh, penetrating insights, so people like Yoichi or Dana, talk about those more difficult subjects. But it, they certainly could build nuclear weapons. Uh, let's just take a very conservative approach. But there was an interesting article the other day about how uh, the missiles that would, they would use mm-hmm. that were Japanese-designed missiles, I believe, these would be the missiles uh, that would be used to launch the weapons. They have the highest rate of failure of uh, any of the vi- missiles available. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty ridiculous because uh, Japan was nuked once and then they nuked themselves and then well, the story that came out today, the U.S. had plans to drop at least 10 more atomic bombs on Japan to end the war if necessary. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I've got the story yeah, I, up. Holy <laughs> mackerel. And I just read uh, that uh, there, the uh, U.S. Department of Energy is planning to build a memorial to the Manhattan Project, you know, for the parks and services. Oh, yeah, might as well uh, build it to uh, s- Satan himself. Uh, yeah, that's uh, sick. I mean, you know, Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just a quick word on the, uh, you know, we were talking about the restart in uh, Kyushu, which has already hurt, happened in the volcano area. But this next one in Niigata, which has, uh, in 2007, there was a big accident there, and there was a big fire because there was a, uh, a uh, earthquake that just tore up the landscape. I remember seeing the photograph. The, actually, the land inside the area of the nuclear plant was uh, uh, disabled, was moved. I and remember that fire. story. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, 2007. And I remember teaching my students, and they were like, huh? I didn't hear about that. Anyway, so uh, that's the same plan, and it's it's been plagued with all sorts of uh, problems the whole time, the whole existence. It's run by TEPCO. And it, uh, and so that's the next one that TEPCO wants to restart. And the NRA, uh, originally they seemed pretty objective and hard-headed, but then they were taken over by Abe pretty much, political pressure. And so now... They are, um, they've done a turnabout and they're, you know, saying, yeah, this is the next one we want to restart. But the thing is that the reactor that they used is the same one as at Fukushima. And their original idea was, well, we have to figure out what went wrong in Fukushima if we're going to restart any of the same types of reactors. Uh, they're called, um, uh, I'm not good at technical things really. I'm, more, I'm a B- political B- guy. BWR. 
Yeah. Oil and water BWR. reactors. And, and, and I, um, BWRs. Yeah. yeah. But the point is, it's the same type of reactor. And the, the, the key point is, they said we were going to find out what happened in Fukushima, and then they didn't. They haven't, and they never will. And That's then they're right. Gonna so it's a, it's a change of position that's unjustified. And, well, there's one thing. The, the, the governor of Niigata is totally against this, and he just is he's fuming angry, I think, about this. So that's a good, good for him. thing, but... <laughs> so those are, yeah, so there's, you know, there's still a lot of people that are very skeptical about nuclear power, but there's people in Japan that are brainwashed. Um, the the countryside people are, are more naive, I think, and they have more voting power. So that's a political problem. Uh, and so, yeah, when you ask that, is Japan, a, I mean, who's running this country? I mean, I think it's, you know, ultimately maybe the Rothschilds or somebody like that, but below them there's a lot of different mm-hmm. factions of people. Are, are you getting are you getting any reports, Richard, of the the black we'll call it fungus on the roadways? Right. You still uh, getting that? I, yeah, I haven't I haven't heard about that. And the websites that I you know, and I don't go to only mainstream at all. Um, I haven't discovered that. And I do take measurements on my own occasionally just to t- check out in the drainage ditches and so on. That's sure. something I, I have a little more time. I'll try to do that this summer. To gather a little more data, but okay. um, the, the uh, you know that by the way that um, that explosion in China, and then we had a, an explosion in Thailand. And yes. I don't know, uh, I, you know, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but it is we should be skeptical or wondering that these things happen. Abe gave his phony war apology. Um, it could be totally unrelated. Uh, these things could be totally unrelated, but there could be connections. But it, it's kind of disturbing overall. That was a, uh, a, a, an enormous really ex- yeah. explosion. Yeah, right. uh, there are people talking about kinetic weapons being dropped from space by the United States uh, to teach China a lesson, and I, I, I just can't get behind that. Uh, there's uh, right. I'm, I'm glad I asked about that. Right. I, it's, you think it was just an accident, probably. I mean, well, accidents happen, for God's sakes. Yeah. Why would they put that much potential explosive power in one location like that? Just for openers. I mean, that it just it doesn't make sense. Well, so uh, it was just a badly managed uh, situation. That well, look what happened at Fukushima. Come on, yeah, no crap happens. Yes, Good, yeah, especially in the industrial world where it's all about money and metal and human values are not. Care. They're secondary. Good. Yes. Good enough. Can I ask Dana a real quick question? Go ahead. Dana, whatever happened to that this clown Jay Cullen and uh, his, ah. his phony Marine Environmental Observation Network and uh, all Good that question. stuff? Uh, just because I wrote about that, and I know he's. He represents the phony science going on over there. <laughs> he does. He's on tour. He's all over the place, and he rents little tiny buildings, and he doesn't put out any flyers, and he holds speeches in communities. Now he and I got some of these uh, recorded and given to me, sent to me. And what he does is he tells people that a pack of cigarettes is much more dangerous in Fukushima, and he's still denying there's multi reactors down there. But when he's out public in, on the TV or radios, he admits it. But when he's doing the lectures in, into the community, he doesn't admit it. Oh, so okay. he's out there now. He's out there going full steam. And he, his job is, uh, he's just a PR firm. His job is to go up against, uh, organize opposition to go up against people like us. Uh, and they're very good at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're very good at it. They took uh, down 30 of my videos recently, yeah, in a row. Um, but uh, it's the end of the night, so we'll let you go. And, you know, remember that a, a nuclear weapon, when it goes off, about 5% of it is uh, the fissionable, you know, is what you consider fissionable product released into the environment. Mm-hmm. Where a melter, a melter reactor, it's it's because it, it, a nuclear explosion lasts is a couple of se- you know, seconds, that whole sure. plume and everything. And Fukushima doesn't stop. And each of those reactors, they just don't stop. They're just constantly cannibalizing, consuming. How many people, Dana, have you run into who understand the basic rudimentary situation at Fukushima as we try to present it each week? (laughs) No, not a single one. See, and these are people who make their living on the ocean. I mean, they fish. They uh, this is this is really pathetic. Well, they, they all, the, the powers that be, they own the media, and they've, they've won, at least 
on the large scale. I've seen, three, I've seen three of them just now go down with 10 dozen beers. So. <laughs> 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 All right. So, take you take, take care. Much. Take care, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, talk to you. And we'll talk next time. Okay. okay. I'll be in the port again. I'll Very good. Again. Okay. Good night. Goodbye, and Dana. <laughs> Richard, thanks uh, very much for the update and the report. How are the, uh, how, how are the, well, I don't know, you, I guess there are many different kinds of Japanese sure. restaurants there, but. Uh, oh, yeah, the, I, you know, I was walking the other day, and just, you know, business as usual, and there's a lot of sushi, this really stuck out, and I was thinking of you, really, a sushi uh, restaurant where it goes around and around, a rotator sushi thing, and you pick the plate off there, and it was just packed full, you know, and I mean, nobody, they don't have a clue. They're, you know, they're consuming not only cesium, but like Dana said, all of the other nuclides that are they go along with it that aren't even reported. And it's just they're just absolutely unaware, and they just figure it's shogunai, which means uh, it's fate. Anyway, I can't do anything about it. Oh, that's a nice way to look at it. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. But we're, we're doing our best to educate people in our way, so I'm, you know, I'm happy to have helped. Well, you have been a great help. Them, Thank so. you very much uh, yeah. for the papers and everything else. And we'll talk to you sure. soon. You take okay, care. Good. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Richard Wilcox and uh, Dana Durnford. There's your there's your report, and we try to give you uh, in broad brush strokes at least the truth and the reality of the situation. Because reality is hard to come by anymore. You've got to really know what you're doing. It's, it's a, The truth is easy. That can be spun and twisted and corrupted in two seconds by the media. Reality is real. We will be back tomorrow night. Thanks for being here.